All right, uh, let's get started. So welcome, uh, welcome to this session. Thank you for, uh, for showing up. It's a very, very full room again. It's a pleasure. My name is Julian. I'm a tech evangelist uh, with AWS, and I focus on AI and machine learning. And uh, actually, we have the, the, the pleasure of having uh, Nils uh, on later in a few minutes <laughs> with us on stage from uh, a small company you probably have never heard of uh, called British Airways. I'm not sure what those guys do, right? Uh, and in this session, we're going, to, uh, we're going to talk about machine learning, obviously. We're going to focus on a service called Amazon SageMaker. Uh, Niels will tell you about how British Airways use machine learning um, for uh, predictive maintenance. It's a really, really cool story. And then I'll come back and uh, focus on deep learning. And I'll run uh, a pretty long and extensive demo on uh, training Keras models on SageMaker, doing all kinds of stuff. So, Let's get to it. So as you probably know by now, SageMaker is a fully managed service for machine learning. And uh, it lets you go from experimentation, early days, all the way to training, deploying, and scaling models with the same service and the same SDK. Okay, so you don't have to jump from one tool stack to the next, uh, from one experimentation tool stack to uh, another one for uh, for, for deployment and ops. It's, you can really go all the way. Uh, it's been out for a couple of years now. It's quite popular. We see a really good adoption from all kinds of companies, from startups to uh, uh, really large companies in really all verticals. Okay? And we'll hear about uh, BA in a few minutes. So this is, in a nutshell, what SageMaker lets you do. Okay? go seamlessly using the same APIs from experimentation in a notebook, maybe, all the way to training on fully managed infrastructure, never worrying about a single server, and then deploying either for a real-time prediction using HTTPS endpoints or for batch prediction using batch instances. And again, um, just like for training, um, deployment doesn't require you to do any infrastructure work, okay? So you can focus 100% on machine learning. So if we look at the machine learning cycle, um, which is uh, much more than just algorithms, by the way. I know we like to zoom in on algos and hyperparameters and, and all the crazy machine learning stuff, but to me, machine learning is really an engineering process, so it should go all the way from figuring out uh, what the data is all the way to maintaining models and scaling models uh, in production. And that's what SageMaker lets you do. Those uh, gray boxes is actually where SageMaker helps. Uh, and I just want to call out a couple of uh, extra services, like SageMaker Ground Truth, uh, which we launched at reInvent last December that lets you annotate data sets at scale, whether they're image data sets, text data sets, or something else using custom workflows. Uh, you can actually build workforces, um, which could be even external wor workforces based on uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, for example, and really annotate at scale. Okay, I won't talk about ground truth in this session, but if you have um, annotation pain points, please take a look at this service. And uh, when it comes to deployment, uh, which is actually the hardest part in machine learning, uh, we also built a couple of services called Neo and Elastic Inference, um, so I'll come back to those later on, but in a nutshell, Neo is, uh, uh, lets you compile your models for the underlying architecture to extract more performance. Okay, so uh, this is useful on any kind of infrastructure, whether it's instance-based, whether you're deploying to EC2 instances, or whether you're deploying to IoT devices, like ARM-based devices, for example. Uh, you can compile your model and, uh, and extract more performance from the hardware. And Elastic Inference, which I'll show you in the demo, is a really, really cool service to optimize costs um, and, and still get GPU acceleration. Okay, so we'll get to those. So SageMaker is really a family of services. But okay, enough about SageMaker for now. Please uh, have a big round of applause for Nils from British Airways. And the stage's yours. Thank you. And good afternoon. I hope you're all enjoying your summit so far. I'll be talking briefly about the work uh, that we have been doing at British Airways with um, 
the support of Amazon um, on our predictive maintenance platform called AI2, Aircraft Information Intelligence. Um, it's not, not very clever, the name, but it's a, a nice logo. But at this point, uh, we have had um, some successes with uh, the help of our Amazon account managers and teams. So um, hopefully, I can give you some sneak peeks or some sort of light, nice little insights that you can take home and sing or consider for your own for your own developments. First of all, who are we? British Airways. Some of you might have used our services before. Some of you might have included us in tweets, Instagram, Facebook posts, whatever. Um, all good stuff, hopefully. Um, we fly at this point around 290 aircraft or a bit more, and 60, uh, 46 passengers per annum in about 200 destinations in 40, uh, 74, 75 countries plus. Um, and since we're talking about birthdays and stuff, BA is also celebrating their 100th anniversary this year. Um, and what we did is to celebrate this is pick up some of our retro liveries and paint some of those beautiful aircraft in historic colors on what is probably known as a perfect British summer day. Um, it's a bit tricky to get them into one spot at a time, so tough luck. Um, and from this point on, those are flying around the world. And also, what we are interested in, they collect data for us. Talking about data, flight data. What's that all about? So flight data for us is, on traditional aircraft, two, two sources. Modern stuff tend to be a bit more clever, a bit more advanced, but let's keep it simple. In a nutshell, we have time series data. This is um, continuously recorded on the aircraft. It's time-stamped, and usually one sample, multiple samples a second, either during the complete flight or during certain phases, let's say a takeoff, a landing period, whatever. The other bit is reports, um, different in as much as they are actually generated by logic on the aircraft. So that could be some sort of event, some sort of condition, let's say, again, a takeoff or landing, your top of cruise, uh, top of climb, or something like that. But those are just a little blip of data. If we focus on time series data, this is probably something that you guys are slightly familiar with, our uh, flight data recorders. However, this is not what we are using. Those are pretty, pretty hard to reach. So for our purposes, we use something else, which is actually black. Um, so this is what we call a, a wireless uh, quick access recorder. Wireless means it's, uh, this model has 3G capabilities, and so as soon as the aircraft is on the ground, it starts transmitting data. Um, other aircraft types have different, different technologies, Wi-Fi, or even car technologies on some of the older models. However, those boxes record continuous data streams. We pick those data streams up, start to process them, and those data streams are interesting, let's call it that. They are raw binary data streams, so it's nothing clever. It's just systems designed in the 60s and 70s. So um, it's not state of the art, unfortunately, but this is what we have. Um, and as I said, this data is only available once you're on the ground. So it's no real sort of real time stream of data that you can tap into. Um, the other bit for us is now we're actually lives that data. So this is one of our A380s. Um, I had the pleasure of taking a few pictures for you. Uh, the avionics bay you see on the A380 in the lower and the upper sort of area of the cockpit, um, I've highlighted those bit reds. Um, this is the low, lower avionics bay. So the roof is basically sort of the floor of the cockpit. And this little blue, uh, this little red arrow shows you the actual recorder position. And it's, in this case, it's not really sort of easy access, but because it's uh, cellular technology, we can access or retrieve that data fairly quickly. The second source of data that we have is, is reports. And um, yet again, those reports are sort of single text-based messages used for ATC surveillance, crew, company comms, and all sorts of stuff, but also in our case, also for maintenance purposes. 
Um, what that looks like is on the left side, we have an A380, right, a 787. Um, you have your big screens. In this case, it's a very simple example. We're talking about a weather request. So in flight, a pilot can just hex, uh, hack some, some sort of request and then say, OK, I'm flying to London now. I'm coming into London to land in an hour. So what is the weather like? Um, for our purposes, that's a slightly different um, tool set. Our data is mostly ASCII-based, could also be raw binary. But in a nutshell, it requires some processing in order to make it useful. So summing things up, our data set, um, we record up to 3,500 parameters, continuous data, um, which is probably, it's not really impressive, but it's about 20 megs per hour, considering some of those aircraft are a bit older. Um, we have about 15 million reports per year that we sort of aggregate. And this is only sort of our engineering-related subset. And we have a history of about 5 million flights. So for us, that gives, gives us an, a nice data set that we can use to actually start, build, aggregate, and use for our purposes to actually stream our operation. And this is sort of the reason. Why are we doing this? Why, what's the reason for this development? Um, aircraft are designed to be reliably redundant. And also, aircraft are designed, or over the decades of operating, we have designed processes to actually improve safety and cap, catch and capture a lot of things. However, as, as some of you might be painfully aware, um, it doesn't always work. It's never going according to plan. So we do have occasions where we have issues on the ground and we can actually look in the data and we can spot those patterns. Usually what happens is um, the aircraft starts to develop a certain condition. It sends out a message and we deal with that. However, that could mean that you're sitting in Heathrow waiting to go somewhere and we just have to say, sorry guys, we have to replace a part that takes us an hour or two or three. Um, but the key, uh, key aspect for us is actually to dispatch the aircraft safely. So with our data set and with our expertise, we can start to look at patterns in the data and predict or prevent those unscheduled maintenance uh, inputs in order to say, OK, actually, hang on. This aircraft will develop an issue that we need or we can preempt now. And at this point, we then have a maintenance input, let's say, overnight and the passenger experience is unaffected. In this case, um, this is what you would get in the cockpit. Um, this is a fuel imbalance alert. Uh, it's usually with an audio signal as well. But as a very simple example, so if you do nothing, you just get the maintenance message in the cockpit. And at that point, pilots are communicating with our engineering desks and actually trying to troubleshoot the aircraft, which is not the experience that we want, but also that's not the experience that we want our customers to have. So enough about aircraft. Let's talk a bit about our architecture. Um, we, we have been doing this work on Amazon for about two years. We started with a clean sheet of paper, which was really amazing for us because that allowed us to adopt serverless technologies and we didn't have any sort of strings attached, no legacy sort of things that you need to worry about and migrate about or migrate anywhere. So what we have is our aircraft. That aircraft transmits data via various means. So we have satellite communication, we have 3G, we have Wi-Fi, we have also cards that data comes into BA. Um, we have an application, an in-house application called FDB, which is our data distribution application that feeds some of the um, redundancies and some of the security layers that we have on-prem and with other, other companies um, that monitor aircraft health. And we piggyback, basically, um, a transfer into Amazon S3 on top of that. This gives us the identical data set that we have in our on-prem tools in Amazon. And that's, for us, the, the first step to actually do stuff with data in Amazon. Now, what happens once that data sits in Amazon? It lands in an S3 bucket, triggers an MQM. We use uh, Fargate as our serverless compute uh, or Docker container sort of technology. And we use Amazon Aurora for our config and metadata. Um, 
at this point, it's just a plain old Postgres Aurora. We are hoping, or we are waiting like a great many on the serverless uh, Postgres Aurora bit, but um, yeah, we're still waiting. In, in our case, the first step is we have this data which is fairly unstructured in a lot of ways specific to an aircraft type, so we start cleaning that stuff up. We start formatting that into a generic and sort of common format that we can use and trigger an SQS message, uh, SQS message yeah, that sends that off to the next step, which is metadata generation. So in essence, what we do with that data is we associate a flight with a, a certain bit of data that we have recovered that sits on S3. So that allows us to say in a year's time or in two years' time or in five years' time to say, actually, hang on, we have had this flight on the 3rd of May 2019 from this registration from point A to point B, and we can recover it. And the last step is then the interesting bit. This is what we're here for, problem evaluation. We use Amazon Lambda for that. Uh, first of all, light layers are pretty cool, and that allowed us to scale that up rapidly. But in a nutshell, we don't expect our fleet to triple or quadruple in, a, in the next couple of years. So that initial process will stay constant in terms of data throughput. However, if we grow our amount or the amount of problems that we want to monitor, lambdas become so much easier to scale and to handle. So that part is. is sort of then just, okay, you just create one SQS, or you can create 50 SQS, Lambda scales it for you. I don't have to worry about that stuff, which is really nice. So we're talking about this. What are we doing? Traditionally speaking, what happens is we pick up a file, and that says, okay, I'm an A320, I'm a 787, I'm an A380, and what do I have to do with that file? So you check, uh, we check the database and say, okay, we have to run X events against that, a, a Lambda checks that, creates an SQS message, triggers an, another Lambda, and then kicks off this sort of evaluation. Um, we do have a web dashboard in front of that, and because of the shortage of time, I just sort of mentioned that, in, or gloss the, uh, throw that in now. But in a nutshell, if we find something that is a bit unusual in the data, we just create an alert on our dashboard that pops up in front of our engineers, and they will start to deal with that problem. So that's actually quite nice. However, for us, the problem was, well, if you imagine you have, at the moment, we fly uh, five different aircraft families. We will get a sixth one in summer. Um, you have a maintenance burden for every bit of code that you write. You also have new things that you want to develop. So in a nutshell, you build a bit of a cottage industry over time because you have a lot of Python scripts. Uh, that's what we are using in London. Uh, in, in Lambda to, to manage. So we were thinking about, could we actually use machine learning for, for some of those problems that we're facing? And yeah, you can. So similar, similar approach. A Lambda checks our database. And in machine learning problems, we create um, a model, which is then sort of stored on S3. And the Lambda function creates the SageMaker endpoint that we can, or will call in a bit. So once that SageMaker endpoint is alive, we kick off an SQS. That then creates a Lambda function which generates a data set that gets uh, passed into SageMaker. And uh, the Lambda function then um, gets that result back, which will be then evaluated in the last Lambda function. And yet again, if you look at that uh, data set and you think it's dodgy, it's strange, it's weird, you need looking at that data set, you have a, a, an alert on our dashboard. So this was a bit of a quick overview of what we have done. Um, the, the core bit for me, I think that is probably worth reflecting on as lessons learned. Um, we are fairly new to that topic. Um, I think we have quite a, a unique and interesting data set. Uh, we have very interesting problems, as you can see here. Um, but what are our challenges? And the first one is, guys, you do need to understand your problem. For us, um, we have engineers, subject matter experts that work on the aircraft engine, certain problems that come to me and say, look, 
I have this problem. And the immediate thing for me is then you have to reverse your role. You get asked questions, but you don't really understand what they're after. So make sure you understand the problem first. You need to understand what they want, what they want to get out of it, what's the business reason. Um, you need to ensure data quality. In our case, um, we built ourselves a little framework that generates the same data set, the same data cleaning for training purposes as well as for the sort of live um, data that we generate and that we pass into our SageMaker endpoint that I, or into this sort of diagram that I showed on the previous slide. But for us, um, we have engineers evaluating the data so the accuracy and the quality of the model doesn't need to be to 99.99 degrees. We always have a hu human evaluating the data, and that's something that we truly believe in, that the human interface or the human aspect of this data set is, is important. Whereas if you have a completely automated process, you need to make sure your model is bang on right. Second, or a third point is ask questions. Ask a lot of questions. And when you're done, ask even more. So in our case, we had help from our lovely Amazon account manager who might be in the room. Paul, thank you for all the stuff. Um, if you don't have that luxury, there's a ton of stuff on the internet. The SageMaker docs, the Sage, I, I know that's a bit of a dry subject, but look at them. The, the examples are really good. They helped us in a lot of cases, and they gave us the kick that we needed to actually say, okay, guys, we, we pulled something off, and then what we did is we went to our senior management and said, it works, and you get business support at that point. This is how we managed to actually progress our machine learning efforts. My last point, um, apply the easiest solution. Um, what we have discovered, and this is probably something that some of you might have found out yourself already, I think there are probably three types of machine learning problems that we have faced so far. Things that we could save with machine learning very easily, things that could potentially be saved uh, or solved with machine learning, but we just don't have the skill set yet. And there's a big, big third category, and that's stuff that just doesn't work with machine learning. So be always prepared to step back and revisit what you're doing, because you might have an ideal example, and you might have a data set that just looks a bit different, and you just try to fiddle it in there, and it just won't work. So make sure that if you have a problem that you can solve in three lines of code, it's usually the better idea, because eventually someone will come to you and ask, well, how does this work? And if you don't have a good answer to that, you're screwed. Um, so this is where we are. The two last slides for me is, where are we going next? Um, something that is potentially useful for us is, as I said earlier, we have a set of aircraft engineers that know the problems, that understand the problem, that understand the aircraft. So what we want to give them is a tool set where they can generate a set of parameters and metadata and sort of all that stuff, bunch that up and kick off a SageMaker training job. Um, in the next step, we have then a trained model that we can evaluate and feedback the result of that training exercise to our engineers. If it's a yay, amazing, we have something that we can just put into production, uh, into development. Um, if it's not working quite right, um, well, then we need to spend a bit more time on it. But in a nutshell, I guess our tame engineers will blow up our Amazon bill quite quickly once this is out. But for, for us, it gives you the, or it, it gives us the opportunity to actually start rolling out a lot of things that are sort of low-hanging fruit because people just say, okay, I want those bits and this, and you just make it work. Um, the second problem for us is we create an alert on a dashboard. Our engineers evaluate the data, and then they create a work package to fix the plane. At the moment, the alert says, ooh, this looks weird. Engineer, take a look. So we want to be a bit more specific about that. There is a ton of interesting stuff that you could do once you have detected something weird. Yet again, a second analysis in SageMaker where you start digging a bit deeper. So we'd like to um, refine our, our technology a bit and our detection a bit to actually offer root cause. 
And the other bit is time to initiate a, uh, an action. So if you have two aircraft that need a fix, and some problems are more pressing, so you have something that could go on for another week, and something would, fall, would cause a problem tomorrow, you'd fix the one first that causes you a problem tomorrow. And this is something where, where we are sort of working on, because at that point we need labeled data and have a sort of good quality data set ourselves to actually train and build the model for that. And in our case, um, this is sort of something that we'd like to look into to give our engineers a bit of a steer, a bit of a prioritization in terms of what to do next. That's all for me. I'll hand back to Julian, and thank you very much. All right, excellent stuff. Thank you very much. Um, now I have a million questions when I'm flying on BA, right? can go and pester them with questions. Uh, OK, so let's, uh, let's keep zooming in. Uh, and in this next section, I want to focus on, uh, on deep learning. Um, so when you train on SageMaker, uh, you really have three options. You can work with uh, built-in algorithms. And, uh, and this is what Niels and his colleagues did, OK, uh, using built-in algos. Um, off the shelf, just configure them, use them directly, no machine learning coding required. Um, you can also use built-in frameworks. And we have a collection of, uh, of machine learning frameworks, TensorFlow, MXNet, Scikit-Learn, et cetera, uh, that are pre-installed, pre-optimized. And you just bring your own code. And this, this is what we're going to focus on. But just in case you need something else, if you use R, C++, any other language for training and prediction, obviously, uh, you can also run this on SageMaker if you build your own training and prediction container and, uh, and push it to, uh, to SageMaker to run. Okay? So lots of flexibility. Uh, and, um, and I should not forget the machine learning marketplace, which we launched at reInvent, where you have uh, quite a few off-the-shelf models trained by AWS partners, all kinds of different things, NLP, computer vision, et cetera, uh, that you can try uh, most of the time for free and just deploy in a few clicks. If they do the job, then fine. Uh, you don't have to worry about any of these. You can just deploy the model and use it. Okay? So take a look. This might just save you uh, months of work. But assuming we have to build, and assuming we want to use deep running for this, then we have to rely on one of those libraries. Um, and like I said, we have built-in containers for training and prediction. Uh, they are actually open source. Um, I didn't include scikit-learn in there, because it's not deep learning. But whatever I'm saying here also applies to scikit-learn. Um, so these containers are open source. So you could go grab them, inspect them, uh, run them locally, customize them, uh, run them again on SageMaker, you know, anything that fits your purpose. Um, and you can use this feature, which I'm going to demonstrate, called script mode. And script mode is really, really cool, because it lets you bring the exact same code that runs on your laptop or your local server outside of SageMaker and run it unmodified inside uh, one of those containers. Okay? And as SageMaker is fully managed, obviously, there is zero work uh, on infrastructure. You train and deploy on fully managed instances. So you just say, hey, give me X instances of this type, and that's all there is. Okay? So you'll never manage a server again when it comes to deep learning. Distributed training, so training on multiple instances, is available out of the box. Uh, if anybody here has tried setting up distributed TensorFlow or distributed MXNet, um, I'd be surprised if it was a pleasant experience. So good news, you don't have to do that again. And another feature that I really like is called pipe mode, where uh, instead of copying data sets to the training instances, you stream them directly from S3. Okay? which basically lets you train on infinitely large data sets. Okay, you could be training on a petabyte of data and, uh, and not worry too much about it. Okay? Um, so when it comes to TensorFlow, uh, we have uh, quite a few customers uh, running TensorFlow on AWS. This uh, research report actually told us last year that 85% of cloud-based TensorFlow runs on AWS. So that's, that's quite a big number. Uh, and uh, we're pretty uh, humbled by that. But we felt it gives us a responsibility you know, uh, to, to make TensorFlow run really well for all those customers. And actually, we have a dedicated team 
uh, in AWS that focuses on optimizing TensorFlow on EC2 instances. Okay, so for example, for the latest uh, Intel uh, C5 instances, they, um, they optimize TensorFlow so that it now trains 11 times faster. Okay, this is for an image classification uh, um, uh, model, but you can expect important speed ups. And uh, we also, you know, they also got to work on, uh, on GPU instances, and they realized TensorFlow was not scaling so well on a uh, on large number of GPUs, so they fixed that, and now you get near linear scaling all the way to 256 GPUs. And we do similar work on other libraries. So when you use those uh, built-in frameworks on SageMaker, you're not using generic vanilla versions. You're using versions that have been you know, tweaked and optimized by our own teams. Okay, so let's look at an example. So I'm going to show you how to train with uh, Keras um, with TensorFlow as the back end. And I'm going to demonstrate some features like script mode, automatic model tuning, and elastic inference. All right, let's get to work. And I'm using this, uh, of course, in a Jupyter notebook. And I think this is the one. <laughs> Okay, yes. Can you read in the back? Yeah? Okay. Sort of? <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to train, um, I'm going to train um, a rather simple convolutional neural network uh, on a data set called Fashion MNIST. So Fashion MNIST is a Zalendo data set that is a, a drop in replacement for MNIST. So same number, 10 classes. Um, uh, black and white images, etc. So it's it's really similar to MNIST, okay? But it's just a little more challenging to train. Uh, so maybe let's let's look at the code first, okay? So I'm not going to go too deep on Keras, um, but this is what the code looks like, okay? So I'm passing some parameters and keep those in mind because this is actually w how script mode works, okay? So I'm passing some machine learning parameters, epochs, learning rate, etc. And I'm also passing uh, those uh, four environment variables, GPU count, model deer, et cetera, et cetera. Because if you, write your, if you write your local code like this, okay, if you run that code like this on the laptop, then using script mode on SageMaker, you can run it unmodified. Because those four environment variables will be passed by SageMaker. Okay? So provided you write your code like that, it runs exactly the same on SageMaker. Okay? So grabbing some parameters, downloading the data set, okay, and then pretty much building the, building the CNN, using, for example, some of the hyperparameters that have been passed, like dropout is actually a, a parameter. The number of neurons in the last fully connected layer is also a parameter, et cetera. Okay, and then we, tr we compile the model, we train it, and we display metrics and we save it uh, in TensorFlow uh, serving format. Okay, so about 100 lines of vanilla Keras code. Again, the important bit that you need to remember is you need to pass, be able to process those parameters. Okay, so now let's first download Fashion MNIST, okay? So download it to that uh, local notebook instance. Upload it to S3, because that's where SageMaker needs the data to be, it needs to be in S3. But first, just to prove my point, I want to show you that you can actually train that script outside of SageMaker. Okay, so here I'm training it, I'm shelling out from the Jupyter Notebook, uh, but this is what you would do on your laptop. Okay, so calling Python mnist keras tf.py, training for one epoch. Okay, so there's no SageMaker involved here at all. Okay, I just need to make sure these environment variables are set, so no GPU here. Save the model uh, in TMP model and grab the training and validation set from the data directory. Okay, so set this up on your laptop and you can train. I'm just training from one epoch just to make sure my script works. Okay, it's training for one epoch. I don't care about the accuracy. Okay, so you, you wrote that stuff on the laptop. It, it, you're happy with it. Now you want to start working with SageMaker to scale it and, and train on bigger data maybe. So the first step you could try is to use a feature called local mode. So local mode lets you use the SageMaker SDK, but you're not using 
manage infrastructure yet. Okay, you're training on that local machine here, which in this case is a notebook instance managed by SageMaker, but this could also work on your local machine. So the benefit here is that you are actually using the TensorFlow provided, uh, the SageMaker provided TensorFlow container to train. Okay, so this TensorFlow object from the SageMaker SDK is the, 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 the object that we use to configure training. And you can see the first parameter is the actual script. And here I want to train on my local instance. So I set instance type to local GPU, okay, because I, I want to use that local GPU in there. And I could pass hyperparameters if I wanted, leaving all everything else to default. Okay, so here, you know, we can see we're actually creating a, a SageMaker training job, but instead of using managed infrastructure, we are really training locally. Okay, so we are pulling that TensorFlow container to that instance, and we, we get training going. Okay, so this proves that I don't need to modify my code, and m this code is running fine in the SageMaker environment, so to speak. Okay, and again, I'm just training for one instance to, to, to check everything is fine. Now, obviously, at some point, I want to train at scale. I want to train for long. I want to train for real. Okay, so here I'm going to say, okay, now, using the exact same code, not changing a line in my Kara script, and just changing here the instance type, I want to train on fully managed infrastructure. Okay, so the only thing I changed here is actually, uh, yeah, I can't see my pointer here probably, but okay, instead of saying train locally, I'm saying trail on MLP32 Excel. Okay, so this will fire up a P32XL instance, which is a GPU instance with the NVIDIA v with V100 GPU inside of it. Uh, and it's going to uh, deploy the TensorFlow container to that, get everything going. Okay, but the only thing you need to say is, hey, just do it. Okay, and again, the only thing I changed is this, from local mode to fully managed mode. But of course, you know, why, why just train one model? We could do automatic model tuning, right? We could explore different parameters. So here are those five hyperparameters that you saw in the code. Let's optimize them, right? Let's explore for them. And I have reasonable ranges for all of them, you know, epochs, learning rate, batch size, etc. And so I want SageMaker to train, in this case, uh, 50 jobs, as you can see, two by two. Okay, and after each training, uh, use uh, machine learning optimization to predict what the next set of parameters to be explored should be, okay? So it's not random search. It's really using prediction at each step to find out what, next, what the next parameter should be and, and quickly converging to high performance models, okay? So um, I have to define the metric that I want to optimize on. So here I'm going to, op to optimize for the validation accuracy, okay, which is logged by the Kera script, and I want to maximize it. Okay, and then I just create this tuner object where I pass the, the baseline estimator, the metric name, the parameter ranges, the number of jobs, and, uh, and voila, as we say, okay? And then I fire up that uh, hyper uh, optimization, hyper parameter job. Okay, and uh, in this case, it took a while because I ran 50, okay? It ran for three hours, okay? And, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I got all kinds of jobs, but the best one that I got, if I look at, oops, the best training job. Okay, the best training job gave me 93.3 something accuracy, okay, which is pretty good for a fashion MNIST, which is a challenging one. And I could see, okay, train for 100 epochs, and these are the dropout values and the number of neurons that it used, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So I guess at this point, the only thing we want is, all right, uh, you train 50, yeah, but I just want to deploy the, the best one. And I just call tuner.deploy, and that deploys the best model, okay? And you could say, well, it's a CNN, so maybe I want to deploy it on a GPU instance, right? Not for fashion MNIST, I agree, but for bigger things, because I want GPU performance to have the fastest prediction. So you could, you could say, well, I want to deploy on P2XL, and that's fine, that's gonna cost me $1.36 per hour. You know, fair enough. Or you could say, um, hey, I wanna use elastic inference. Okay, and elastic inference is basically a way to attach fractional GPU acceleration to any EC2 instance. It could be a proper EC2 instance or it could be a SageMaker instance. 
So what I'm doing instead of deploying to P2XL is I deploy to C5 large, okay? And I add a medium size accelerator. You have three sizes, medium, large, X large, okay? And so that by quickly benchmarking, you can find the level of GPU acceleration that works. And in this case, C5 large plus uh, elastic uh, inference medium give you pretty much the same level of acceleration than a full-fledged P2XL instance, okay? Same ballpark. The difference is the second combination is 80% cheaper, okay? So if you're deploying to GPU instances today, please try Elastic Inference. Please take a couple of hours to benchmark Elastic Inference. You know, you might very well save 80% um, or 70% on that, okay? In this specific case, this adds up to about $800 per month per instance, okay? So this could be the most profitable session you've ever attended, okay? And then, of course, I can predict, okay? So I can call the predict API, uh, HTTP posting some images to this endpoint, and in this case, I think it got the last one wrong, but uh, okay, all the other ones are okay, right? pretty dependent from one batch to the next, okay? But this is how we do it, okay? This is how we do it. So script mode, you know, local mode to train without firing up managed infrastructure, script mode to train your code unmodified, uh, elastic inference to optimize uh, GPU costs, okay? And yeah, we could clean up. So I only got a few minutes left, so I want to show you quickly one more thing because we talked a lot about TensorFlow, but it's not just about TensorFlow. Uh, a lot of customers find that MXNet works very well for them um, because it has some existing off-the-shelf models uh, like uh, Gluon CV for computer vision, Gluon NLP for natural language processing, so toolkits that help you build faster. Uh, you could also use MXNet as a um, um, Keras backend, that's possible, if you'd like, and enjoy probably better performance. Uh, and um, MXNet also come with uh, uh, Java and Scala APIs that are easily integrated in your uh, business apps, okay? Unlike TensorFlow, which is still mostly Python. Okay, and uh, just to conclude, I want to show you, yeah, it's time to have some silly fun. So I want to show you Gluon CV, okay? So Gluon CV is, uh, like I said, a computer vision toolkit, part of MXNet, uh, where you can literally use state-of-the-art models in just a few lines of code. So I'm going, to show how, I'm going to show you how to do segmentation and object detection with a pre-trained model. So literally grab a model from Gluon CV, throw an image at it, and get the job done, okay? So I need to import quite a few things, okay? I'm going to grab a model, okay? So I'm using that mask RCNN uh, model, which is pretty much state of the art. It's been pre-trained on a large data set called uh, Coco, okay? And Coco can do detection and segmentation on all those different classes that you see here, okay? So if your business problem is similar to this, you're in luck, you know? You might just use this directly without training at all. So let's grab a random image, well, not so random, um, a random image from, uh, from the internet, okay? And I want to do segmentation and object detection on that. How complicated is it? Well, it's about as complicated as this, okay? Pass the image to that pre-trained model that I uh, downloaded, and I'm, I'm getting some stuff back, so uh, uh, bounding boxes for detection, masks for segmentation, and confidence scores uh, and class IDs, okay? So obviously, you know, this, these are all numbers. We don't care about numbers. We want to see pictures, so fair enough. So now let's apply the masks and the bounding boxes using those Gluon APIs to the original image. Okay, so five, line, five, six lines of code, and we can do this. And here I restrict it to anything that had 99 plus uh, confidence. Okay, so bounding boxes, two people, and segmentation, the outline. Okay, training this stuff from scratch is really, really hard, in case you wondered. Okay. All right, okay, and I've got 30 seconds left, so can I get two or three people on stage? It's very safe. All right, come on, you guys. Yeah, I never sit in the front row when I'm, when I'm talking. 
OK, this is another one. Hopefully, it's going to run. You don't have to dance or anything. So just, yeah, you, yeah, you can relax, OK? So let's try and make this a little bigger. OK, so if you could please stand in front of the cam. All right. All right, and wave your arms. Just, you know. OK. All right, you see that? OK. <laughs> so I'm going to stand out of the way. All right, you guys look great. Uh, this is called pose estimation. OK, so detecting the pose of the human body, so the eyes, etc., And of course, the, the torso, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the arms, and of course, we would see the legs if you were standing far back. OK, this is available out of the box in Gluon CV. It's literally five lines of code in that demo. So again, um, the amount of sophistication that you get from those toolkits, and Gluon NLP brings you more of the same for natural language processing, is really super, super interesting. So I encourage uh, all of you to take a look. Thank you. You've been great. Thank you very much. <laughs> See? <laughs> yeah.